Okay, it looks like not everybody's back, but it is 12 and I have, still have some things left to cover in this. So let's go back to our frequency distribution. We're going to finish filling it out and then I'm gonna, we're going to look at a couple of different kinds of graphs that you can create using the information. So this is like an organized way of uh, setting up our information and then we'll take this and create different kinds of graphs from this. So you have sort of a visual, a picture of what's going on. So I want to start here with the class boundaries. And, and by the way, let me say a couple of things. Our class limits, those are frequently just whole numbers, not usually through uh, by tenths. The only reason why I did these in tenths was because our data went to the tenths place. And that was the only reason. Uh, for, often data is just whole numbers. And so, and that makes it a little bit easier. Now, when we get to the class boundaries, the class boundaries are what you use for different kinds of graphs when you want the classes to be right up next to each other without any space in between them. And we're going to talk about, there's a couple of different kinds of graphs where we use the boundaries so that there's no gaps. It doesn't look like there's a gap from 9.8 to 9.9, .9, but there is because there's a gap from uh, 9.8. Think of this as 9.8. You could have a 9.81 or 9.82 and and if you had a 9.81 you see there's there's a gap from here to here 9.8 and 9.9 .9 are not the exact same number so what we have when we want there to be it's sort of boundaries are a lot like class limits except um, there's not going to be any gaps so here's what we do to make these so that they don't have gaps so and I misplaced there is Okay, what we do is notice these are all to the tenths place on the boundaries. Those are going to go out one more place to the hundredths place. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to go kind of backwards and forwards. We're going to make each class just a little bit bigger. So instead of starting at 2.8, we're going to go back five hundredths. We're going to call that 2.75. We're going to call this 9.85. Now what I just did was I went back, this is to the tenths place, so I subtracted five one hundredths and added five one hundredths. If these had been whole numbers, then I would have only have added and subtracted five tenths. So basically it's like going back five and forward five. Then when you get to this one, this one is going to start at 9.85 and end at 16.95. Notice with boundaries, there's no gaps. Where this one ends, the next one begins. So this one will be 16.95 to 24 point, and that will be 0, 05 on that one, because right now it's 24.0. And then this will start at 24.05 and go to 31.15. This will start at 31.15 and go to 38. 0.25. Now, if you had trouble understanding that, remember that you can do uh, when it asks you to do boundaries. Remember, you can click on help me solve this or view an example or watch the video or look in the book. There's an example in the book. There's also examples in the PowerPoint for 2.1. All right. So look at those if I went too fast. Now we're going to look at some of the different graphs that we can make using all of this information. Now, one thing we don't use on the graphs, the tally column, my map, my stat lab rarely asks you to do the tally column because that's not the only thing that's used for us to come up with these numbers right here that we came up with for frequency. So <clears throat> I am going to share with you um, a PowerPoint so I can show you the different types of graphs. So if you hold on. And let's see here. So the first one we're going to look at, the first type of graph is called a frequency histogram. So I'm going to leave this up for a second so you can look over it.
Notice a frequency histogram, and I'll point out some important things while we're looking at each type of graph. Notice a frequency histogram is a bar graph that represents the frequency. When you see the word histogram, these bars are going to be connected. Notice it says down here, consecutive bars must touch. So we don't want any gaps. So this is a case where we want to use boundaries so that there won't be any gaps. It says the horizontal scale is quantitative and measures the data values, and the vertical scales measures the frequencies. So you see we're going to track frequency, and then across the bottom we're going to put boundaries. So on the next uh, slide, it talks about how why we have class boundaries, which I just showed you. So in a frequency histogram, and I'm going to go back to that. So on the um, vertical axis, you're going to label the frequency. And down here where it says data values, you're going to have the class boundaries because you don't want there to be any gaps because you want the bars to touch. Because in a frequency histogram, consecutive bars must touch. All right. So if we wanted to make one uh, from the one we have, let's uh, for a couple of these, I'm going to stop and actually do the graph. So let's stop for a second. A frequency histogram is a really common one. So let's stop here. Let's talk about how would we make a frequency histogram. So I'm going to stop sharing this, otherwise it won't get recorded. How would we make a frequency histogram from this data? So I'm going to do this on a separate board so that I don't have to get rid of our frequency distribution. And so if I was making a frequency histogram, then I would put frequency here. Notice my frequencies range from 0 to 9. So I only have to go to 9. So maybe this is 10. Five, something like that. And then down here, we would do our boundaries. So since we're not starting at zero on our boundaries, I'm going to put a little squiggly thing right here. But my first boundary is 27 point, I'm sorry, 2.75. I should have five classes. So this is 9.85, 16.95, you move this so I can see it, 24.05, 31.15, and 38.25. So notice I have my boundaries down here. And then I'm just going to draw bars for each class. This part's easy. Once you get the boundaries at the bottom and the frequencies here, so that first class should be a, a bar that goes up to 9. So that first class is going to be a really high bar. And I'm going to shade it in. Not completely, but you should show it shaded. It shouldn't be blank. Then for our second class, I have a frequency of 2. That would be right here. Sometimes you'll see they'll, they'll write it like they'll write the number above. Now, our next two classes didn't have any frequency, so we're going to have two empty spaces there. You can't leave it out. It has to be there. And then our last one, in our last class, we had um, a frequency of 1. So this is kind of a weird frequency histogram because we had two empty classes. I was hoping we'd be more, you know, varied up, but that's okay. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes you have a class with no data values in it. So 
It looks like we have the majority of us live very close to South Campus. Um, and then we had one person over here who did not. And you can see at a glance, you know, instead of looking at a bunch of data, a, a graph just gives you at a glance uh, way to see what the data shows about that particular topic. In this case, our topic was the distance from South Campus. Okay. All right, let's look at a different kind of graph. So the next kind of graph we're going to look at is a frequency polygon. And so the rest of these graphs, guys, I'm going to go through pretty quickly because I want to talk to you a little bit at the end. I'm going to save about five minutes to talk about the learning catalytics quiz that will come up on your homework. So this type of graph here is called a frequency polygon. And a frequency polygon is a line graph. The other one was a bar graph. And it says it emphasizes continuous change in frequencies. So, and it always starts on the x-axis. It's called a frequency polygon because it starts on this uh, horizontal axis and it also ends on the horizontal axis. The next slide shows, and by the way, if you look up the actual PowerPoint in my stat lab, you'll see a complete example for all of these types of graphs. So we're just going through the different types a little quickly. It says to construct the frequency polygon, use the same horizontal and vertical scales that we used on the histogram. Only this time, notice we're going to label with the class midpoints. This is why we did the midpoint column because on this horizontal axis, we're going to put the midpoints. This is an R graph. This is for the example. So um, we could do this. And what, what they've done is, so this actually was the first midpoint, that 172.5. And then they subtracted a class width to get this. This was the first midpoint. And this one was the last midpoint. And then they go one more. They add and subtract the class width to get these numbers on the end so that they can bring the polygon down to the x-axis. So in reality, your first frequency is right here, and the last one is right here. And then they just go an extra class width on either end uh, to make it start and end at 0. Okay, another kind of graph you can make is a relative frequency histogram. So it has the same shape and same horizontal scale as the corresponding. The only difference is that on the vertical axis, instead of doing frequency, they're doing relative frequency. So on our graph, as a reminder, our relative frequencies ranged from 0 to... Um, the biggest one was 0.75, so maybe 0.75 would be up here. Our graph wouldn't look like this because we'd have two empty ones. But it would look like it has about the same shape as the other one. And for each, um, we'd still do the boundaries down here because this is a histogram. And anytime you have bars that need to touch, you have to use boundaries so that there will be no gaps. So you would still have the class boundaries across the bottom. And basically, you just do bars again like you did for the frequency histogram, except instead of going up to the frequency, you're going up to the relative frequency. So you might have it labeled by 0.1s, like this might be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. And our tallest one, our very first class, would have gone up to 0.75. Here's a slide about constructing a relative frequency, and you can see how they put those decimal numbers, the percents in decimal form over here. And here you see the boundaries. And it just shows you quickly, instead of showing you just the frequency, it actually shows you what percent of the data was in each group. Another kind of graph is a cumulative frequency. This is why we did the cumulative frequency. Remember that column that was at the end of our frequency distribution? 
A cumulative frequency uh, graph is also called an ogive. So that's pronounced um, ogive. That's how you pronounce it. And an ogive is another kind of line graph that displays cumulative frequency. So it says here, the upper boundaries are marked on the horizontal axis. So this is going to start at zero. And this first dot is going to be represented by uh, the upper boundaries. So on our data values, we're going to put the upper boundaries. And the cumulative frequency, remember on ours, that cumulative frequency, if you look at the last column, I don't know if you remember that. Um, I'll show it to you in a minute. But the cumulative frequency, the highest number was 12 on ours. So this would be 6. And it in the number, actually, I'm going to erase that because really this last one here should be at, I'm going to erase that because the last one should be at the top one. So on ours, our last dot would be, our, the cumulative frequency was 12. So the last dot would be up at 12, up in the air. So ogives end up in the air, a vertical line that ends up in the air. And then here's that, I, I left a slide in here that talks about creating an ogive. So it's cumulative frequency. And these are the upper boundaries. And it in, notice it ends up in the air. And it should actually end at, so that this one ends at 30. That means that the, uh, <clears throat> that the total sample size must have been 30. Another kind of graph that you're probably really familiar with, with is a pie chart. Pie chart provides a convenient way to represent qualitative data, not so much quantitative. Our data was quantitative, so we would normally not make a pie chart. So qualitative data, it really shows percents. It divides the circle up into percents of the whole. And so qualitative data, like maybe if you were asking people, um, like, what religion they were, then you would have a piece of the pie would be devoted to each religion, and the percentage, the size of the piece would be would be would correspond to what percentage of the people would did that. Let me show you an example. This one says, so notice what we need for pie chart is relative frequency. And this one they asked, uh, this was the type of degree that's qualitative data. And they took the frequency and they figured out the relative frequency. Now they figured out the angle. You're not going to have to do that, but there is a way to figure out the angle. It's basically taking that relative frequency times 360 because there's 360 degrees in a circle. And that's how they got that 95. But then you'd have to know what 95 degrees look like. Well, a 90 degree angle is a right angle, so it's a little bigger than 90 than a right angle. You see here, that's the yellow piece of the pie here. So on a circle, uh, sometimes it's called a circle chart, circle graph. So on a circle graph or pie chart, you show the percents, and you actually write them in, and you label it with whatever that was that group. There's some other kinds of charts that you may run across. I don't, I don't ask you to do these in a test, but an example is a Pareto chart, which is a bar graph, but they always put the bars in order. All that means when it says Pareto is that the bars are in order of decreasing height. So if you see one like that, um, you'll know what it is. And then um, this is an example of a time series graph. This is not one that I ask you things about, but it's one you might see. It shows how something changes over time. And that's going to have to be quantitative data. Okay, so 
those are the different kinds of graphs. And you're going to be asked questions about some different kinds of graphs in your homework. I'm getting the video ready. Hold on. I'm trying to get it straight. So I, I drew one with our data, and we could draw others with our data. Mainly you're going to be asked questions about graphs, not necessarily asked to draw one. So um, I just wanted to show you that. And you can look over the PowerPoint um, and see the example. They do some examples in the PowerPoint. And you can also do view an example if you get stuck. All right, I'm going to erase this. Um, and basically, I'll answer questions. But I want to go over a few things that you're going to see in your homework. One is the um, show your work quiz, which I'd really like to do with you. I'd like to open it and show that to you. Um, I'm sort of low on time, though. So I don't know. I, I, I'll do that. If you have any questions, if you've tried it, maybe you've already got it, or if you want to see it, I'm going to keep recording, and I'm going to demonstrate how to do the show your work. Um, even if it's after class. So it'll be on the recording. I'll just keep recording. Um, and the other thing that's going to pop up, guys, is something called a learning catalytics quiz. And it will become available to you at 1 o'clock today. Now, I've never done this asynchronously, so I'm not sure exactly how it's going to go. But at 1 o'clock, there's going to be a learning catalytics quiz that's available for you to take. And I've given until class time on Wednesday to take it. So if you have any trouble with this, let me know. Um, and if any of you wouldn't mind when it pops up, shooting me an email and saying, hey, this is what happened and this is what you do, because I don't see it from a student's point of view. And so it would be helpful to me if you shared that with me, because this is the first time I've <clears throat> done one of these quizzes this way. Kendra, did you have a question? OK, I was wondering about the practice. If I don't understand what exactly I'm reading, like if it's not clear, do I click the problem solve or solve a problem? Yeah, either. Um, or, that, or will it show a textbook summary or? Any of those things. Um, I find usually view an example or help me solve this is pretty useful. Um, I will look at that today. Oh, I'll go to me, it's, yeah. It hasn't really been clear when I've used that one, when I'm reading it. And then after that, I've tried to figure out how to solve it. To me, it really doesn't make sense. It doesn't really help, help me answer it. Which one? Um, because of the short. Both Which of them, the problem solve and the examples. OK. Um, you might try then clicking on the textbook or going in the textbook and looking for an example in the book itself. That 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 might help. Um, you can also uh, the videos. You can watch a video in my math lab, uh, in my stat lab on certain things if a video option is there. So if you see a little film strip, if it says watch a video, you can do that. Not all problems have an associated video. So, um, and the other, th the other option would be to join in. Remember, I'm giving extra credit for joining in on the tutoring sessions with our math tutors. And um, the only thing about that okay. would be, OK? I, mm -hmm. Yes, I tried to join the tutoring session yesterday. Um, 
but I didn't have an appointment with an interpreter. So with the tutoring, I'd have to use my phone with um, with Purple. It's a different relay company together, yeah. but I wasn't able to get in uh, the tutoring because I didn't have access to an interpreter at that time. Okay. Well, let's brainstorm about that and ways for you to get in, and um, and Chloe can uh, maybe we can talk about that right at the end of class. Okay. Um, I would like to go to. I'm, I'm going to try to go to my math, my stat lab, and look at the show work quiz for a second, and then we can talk more about uh, the the how, how to the different kinds of helps and what we might do to solve this particular problem. Okay. So um, let me. I'm going to go to. Let me. I've got to open up my stat lab on this device in order to share this with you. So if you guys, if you haven't done the show work, or even if you have, but you're not sure if you showed the work correctly, um, I want to go to, I've got to open it up first. So if you give me just a second, because it times me out. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to go to the course and do a show work. I'm going to work on the show work quiz. Okay, I'm going to um, show you, I've logged in, and I want to show you where I'm at. So when I open the course, it looks like this. And one of the things I wanted to show you guys is, and I'm going to do the show work quiz, but if you look down here at the multimedia library, I want to show you what's available to you there. For example, if you would like to watch a video or something on the skills review, then go, like if the skills for chapter one or the skills review for chapter two. And so notice I went to chapter two. Then I'm just going to select all and tell it to find it. And then if you scroll down, you can see PowerPoint, you can see section video lectures. And over here, far right, you can see videos on all different kinds of things, including uh, summations, um, square roots, dividing square roots. If you scroll on down, you'll see absolute value. So there are videos on all of those things, even if it's in the skills review. And again, the way you get to that is you go to multimedia library, choose the chapter, that we're on so the chapter two skills review would be chapter two and then just say select all and it will show you everything it's got that's related to chapter two okay now I'm going to go to assignments and let's look at the how to show work in my stat lab quiz so I'm going to look at this with you and I'm going to look at question one It's important that you read the directions completely. This says click on show work and the workspace, click on show work. So we're going to do that, but don't do it yet because then you'll lose the problem. It says, um, and then in the workspace provided, use the draw tool, the pencil, and do your best with your mouse or stylus to show your work. First, show the long division to change the fraction to a decimal. Then convert the decimal to a percentage by moving the decimal point two places to the right. So work, then write the percent notation in the answer box provided. So I'm going to show you how I would want you to do this. So note that my problem is 23 over 100. 
Okay, so I'm going to do show work. And it's going to open this new window. And you can use the pencil. What I suggested was that you use the pencil. I'm going to start with the pencil. And I'm going to choose a different color because I don't care for black that much on my pencil. I like lots of color. And so remember my problem was 23 over 100. Now this is kind of hard to do with your mouse. I'm going to give you that. So if you don't want to do this, if you don't have a stylus and you're having trouble drawing with the mouse, you could, if you want to, you can also click the A and that allows you to type. And I don't have, I'm not connected to a keyboard right now. So let me connect this to a keyboard so that I can type. And so I could put 23, let me make sure this will do it. over 100. Do you see how I could I could either draw it or I could type it. I'm going to go back to the one I was drawing. I say equals and I'm looking for that answer. So remember I told you to show this by long division. And guys, I can't I can't hear um I can't see anything in the chat right now when I'm in this. So I'm going to do 23 divided by. Wait, are we supposed to be seeing what you're writing right now? Because the only thing I see is the um, the my lab. Do you you don't see? Does anybody can anybody see the show work that I'm doing? If you can see it, tell me. Okay. Okay, it should be showing you. Let me see. So what are you seeing? Did were you I able to see the part where um, you went to the question? Like it, it's showing um, the page where it says do homework. The page. Okay, hold on a second. It's showing the page that says do homework. Yes. So, but when I click on question one. You can't see question one? No. Huh. OK. In, th in that case, I'm just going to have to talk about it. OK. okay. And then uh, so even on question on question one, I told you to use the draw tool, which is the pencil. But if you're having trouble drawing with the draw tool, you can also type with the if you click on A. You can use the text or draw tool on this one, even though I put use the draw tool. OK, so either one is fine. I mainly and when you show your work, so maybe I should show this. I'll show you. The, I'll show this one up on the board. OK. And I know I've gone past time, but if you guys need to see this, if you haven't done this yet, then um, you might want to stay for a few minutes and just see what I expect on this thing. So. Let me go back to this. OK, so on the show work. You can use the draw tool. On number one, use the draw or the text tool. The draw tool looks like a pencil. Oh, sorry, that's not a great pencil. And the text tool is the A. You can use either one. If you choose the draw tool, you use either a stylus or your mouse to draw. And what I want you to do is I first want you to write the problem. So on mine, my problem was 23 over 100. So I'm either going to draw that or type that after I click on show work. And you can also choose a color like I showed you. And when you use the pencil, you can make it fatter or skinnier lines, but um, it gets really wide. So I usually stick with the one or two point. So I'm writing the problem. 
The goal here was to change this to a percent. Now, I know it's already over 100, so it's already a percent. But what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to show me the work. Not all of them are over 100. This one happens to be. But if I was showing the work, this means 23 divided by 100. So I would do 23 divided by 100. And I'm going to show the long division of the decimals. So that's going to end up giving me, when I do this, so I'd have 2 here, so that would give me 200. And then 3 will give me 300. Remember, you put the decimal straight up. So I wanted to see that you knew that you could change. That here I've changed the fraction to a decimal by division. But you, you don't have to write those words. All I want to see in the work is I want to see that long division. Mainly, guys, I just want you to practice using the drawn text tools. This is going to be a little bit harder to do by text. So try to draw with the mouse. I totally understand if it's a mess. I understand if it's hard to read. That's OK. Don't draw too big because you only you have a limited amount of space. So the purpose of this quiz is really just to practice on showing your work. And you can do it multiple times if you want. Just keep practicing and try to get as good as, as possible at it. When you take your test, there are going to be a few problems where I ask you to show your work. And so that's why I want you to practice on this. And I don't think I put a due date on this. So you can practice this just whenever you want to. I may take I may take a few questions out in some of the homework and ask you to show your work in those, but it will never be the whole homework assignment because that would take too long. So I'll do that. And so now I know that 23 over 100 is equal to 23, if I move the decimal point over two places, 23%. So there I went from fraction to decimal. Decimal is home base. Then I changed the decimal to a percent. So when I show you, when I say show your work, you're going to write the problem. Then you're going to show the work. And then here, you're going to box your final answer. And that's what I want you to do on the show. On number two, I asked you to upload a picture. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have you do that on the test at all. But if I ask you to show work in any of the homework and you want and you want and you prefer to do it by uploading a picture, there is a way to do that. Um, different people do it different ways and it's not extremely straightforward. So I'm, I'm not saying that's super easy. So my advice is to use draw or text if you possibly can. That's, that's going to be your easiest option, unless you're just really good at taking a picture of your work and getting it uploaded. Go ahead and try. I mean, it's just for practice anyway. Um, I'd like for you to try to upload a picture for number two. There's only two questions. There's one where you draw or text, use text, and then there's one where you upload a picture. Two questions in this. And I just want you to be able to use it to practice. If your picture doesn't turn out good, you know, erase it, start over. This quiz is just for practice. And then remember, at 1 o'clock, you should be able to do the learning catalytics quiz. All right. Does anybody have a question before we go? I have a question. Um, so how do you take a picture and upload it? Um, I have instructions for that in Blackboard. I, I put instructions for uploading pictures in Blackboard. Also, you can Google how to upload a picture in my math lab and you can find all kinds of videos about how to do it and if you can't if you can't figure it out it's not going to hurt anything that's why i said if you can draw our text use the text box that's probably going to be your easiest option if you can figure out a way to do it where it's readable okay any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Whoops, sorry.